A synagogue leader named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he what? Fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her, that she will be healed and live. So Jesus what? Agrees. Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now everything's going according to plan. Jairus has approached Jesus. Jesus has agreed. I, Jairus, let's go to your house. Jesus is now following Jairus to the house. A large crowd is following, naturally. Because a crowd wants to know, Jairus and Jesus together? Oh, this is a scandal. <laughs> I need you to enter in to this village that they're in. Put yourself in this town. Jairus is a respectable, notable, named person in this town. The crowd is not just there for Jesus. The crowd is also there for Jairus. They can't believe it. Jairus, of all people, went to go see Jesus? Can you imagine? Come on, come on, come on. Can you imagine folks from Jairus' synagogue saying, he was just talking about Jesus last week. And how this crazy rabbi named Jesus be healing on the Sabbath. But now Jairus got a problem. Come on, don't act like you ain't from no small town. <laughs> don't act like you ain't from no small town. Folks from Jairus' synagogue in the crowd. I can't believe Jairus and Jesus walking together. Now, they're walking, they're walking, they're walking. Can you imagine being Jairus? You're in a rush. My daughter's dying. I got one thing on my mind. D ain't it crazy how the one day you late for work, the person in front of you wants to drive all slow? <laughs> you leave 30 minutes early, ain't no problems. The one time you late, every red light, now Jairus, come on, what would my pace I'm Jarvis looks back. Jesus? Come on. Jesus. My daughter. Jesus is coming. Jesus. People keep grabbing Jesus. Jesus. Stay with me. And a large crowd follow. Come on. What happened? Uh, and press around him. Here we go. Verse 25. Here's where it gets good. And an interruption was there. And a problem was there. Okay, okay, okay. Remember, small what? Small town. You know who'd be responsible for putting a woman who has a hemorrhaging issue out of the synagogue? Jairus. Under Levitical law, this woman can't be in the synagogue. Because if she touches anything, she's going to make it unclean. And if anybody else touches what she touched, now they become unclean. And so the woman has to be ostracized. The woman has to be separated. The woman has to be isolated. And whose job is it to enforce the strictness of the law? The Pharisees, the religious leaders. The synagogue ruler. The drivers. Jesus. Come on, Jesus. What's she doing here? And a woman was there who had been subject to for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Come on, let's keep reading, let's keep reading. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. 
Oh, I'm going to preach this like I feel it. Verse 28. Because she thought. If I just touch his clothes. I will be healed. I've heard a lot of sermons on the woman's touch. But can I tell you something? There would never be a touch if there was first not a thought. The Bible says that because she thought to herself, oh, if I just touch him, I will be healed. Can I make a prophetic declaration in the room tonight? You are one thought away from breakthrough happening in your life. You are one thought away from miracles breaking out in your life your life. You're one thought away from peace. You're one thought away from grace. You're one thought away from wealth. You're one thought away from the generational stronghold that has ruled your thinking to not be an issue any longer. I wish I had some excited people in Iowa tonight that realize I'm one thought away. The woman doesn't have any money left, but she's got her mind. Her body is broken, but she's got her mind. She has no relationships, but she's got her mind. She can't go to church, but she's got her mind. She don't got a synagogue leader, but she's got her mind. Can I tell you, you don't have a money problem. You have a mind problem. Can I tell you something? You don't have a cancer problem. You have a mind problem. You are one thought away from walking into the best season of your life. And if I were you, I'd get my thoughts together and start thinking the right thoughts. Because if you are angry, Anxious all the time, you have a thought problem and you need to get your mind right. Whether you believe you can or can't, you're right. Your mind, your mind. Your mind, your mind, the most powerful thing you have is your brain, your thoughts, what happens between your ears. The Bible says, so a man thinketh, so he is. I tell you, I can tell you who you are if you let me into your mind. What do you dwell on? What do you meditate on? What do you entertain? You are a product of what you think. My father was a crackhead, been on drugs his whole life. You know what? I just never believed I was cursed. I have friends that have dads who are on drugs. Guess what? They believe they're cursed. You know what happens? They're now cursed. What's the difference? No difference in fathers, no difference in neighborhoods, a difference is in what I thought. At the end of the day, you are a product of what you think. And we can emphasize the touch of this woman, but we will never be able to replicate her touch if we don't first replicate her. We can emphasize what she did, but before she ever did anything, she thought something first you can hear anointed teaching all you want if you go home and dwell on foolishness uh oh here we go here we go what, what does Jesus say let me just quote Jesus don't cast your pearls to swine okay how about I say that in the 21st century don't put coins in pockets with holes in them we can give you the best Bible teaching in the world but guess what if you go home and say I'm a failure if you go home and say, it'll never happen. If you go home and say, we'll never get pregnant. If you go home and you think to yourself, I'm always going to be anxious. If you go home and you think to yourself, I'm always going to be sick. If you think the wrong thoughts, you'll never extend the right touch. Come on, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. We're just reading the Bible. This is what Mark says. This is what Mark says. Oh, no, no, no. Give me Matthew. Give me Matthew. Give me Matthew. Oh, 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 oh. Matthew should be in there somewhere. Matthew chapter 9. Is it Matthew chapter 9? I, I wanted to give this to you in, in Matthew's version. I'll read it from my iPad. Matthew chapter 9 says this. Matthew chapter 9 verse 20. Matthew chapter 9 verse 20. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Verse 21. She said to herself. She what? Said to herself. Only crazy people don't talk to themselves. <laughs> she said to herself, 
She said to herself, she said to herself, the thing that makes me nervous, especially about Gen Z and especially millennials, is that we just want to tweet everything, text everything. And it's actually making them socially awkward because they think the power of life and death is in their thumbs. <laughs> Baby, can I tell you something? The power of life and death is not in your thumbs. You can have the best confession typed out in your notes app, but until you start saying something to yourself, I will be blessed. I will be healed. My days of sickness are numbered. I declare by the power of the Holy Ghost that from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, I walk in prosperity. I declare out of my mouth before I leave this house today. I don't care if I wake up my kids. I'm going to say something to myself. I don't care if I make my spouse feel a little uncomfortable. I'm going to say something to myself today because David says I will encourage my Self in the Lord. At some point, you are going to have to think so loud that you start talking to yourself. Because I really don't care about making you feel awkward. I care about me being free. And I will make a confession. Of course we are going to have children. Yes, we are. Infertility will not have the last laugh. Not in my life. Oh, no, it won't. See, see, okay. Can we be honest? We only like saying stuff that we believe. Can I, can I, can I make a, a radical statement? If you don't halfway feel like you're lying, I don't think you're really talking in faith. I really don't. Every faith hurdle I've ever had to jump over. Before it came to pass, the words that came out of my mouth sounded crazy to myself. I remember saying to myself, I'm going to be a dad. And the enemy saying, no, you ain't. Did you see what the doctor said? And for most of us, the voice in your head can muzzle you and mute you. But I declare by the power of the name of Jesus, you are going to stop listening to the enemy's voice. You are going to actually get the right thoughts and start confessing the right things out of your mouth. This is why worship is so important, because we all in one accord begin to say the right stuff. I don't need to feel it. I just need to say it. I don't really even need to believe it. You know what? I need to say it. Everything I've ever spoken by faith sounded crazy to me in the moment. I'm going to be a dad. And in my head, I'm like, I don't really know. But I didn't already said it. Words have power. Come on, come on, back to Mark. Immediately her bleeding. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her. Here we go. Next verse. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked. Now, now, <laughs> this is where it gets ridiculous. Because Jairus is still waiting. <laughs> the woman has touched Jesus. Jesus is clearly walking slow enough for a woman with an ailment to catch up to him. <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody that can relate to Jairus. <laughs> like, Jesus. Okay, I keep looking. Oh, oh. All right. Oh, there's that woman. I kicked out the synagogue. All right. Let me go tell her, leave Jesus alone. Come on, Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Who touched my clothes? Okay, okay, okay. Can I throw you a theological curveball? Pastor Jeff, who's Jesus talking to? I've heard a lot of sermons where people say, well, Jesus is talking to the crowd. Who touched my clothes? And then I've heard a lot of sermons where Jesus is talking to the disciples. Who touched my clothes? Can I ask a radical question? What if Jesus is talking to Jairus? Jairus, who touched my clothes? And Jairus is standing there like, my daughter is about to die. And you ask him who touched my clothes? Jairus is at least in earshot. Jairus hears the question, and I bet Jairus is annoyed. Not only has the woman that I kicked out of the synagogue here touching people, 
just touching the guest speaker. <laughs> just, you just, you're just touching the guest speaker, you know what I'm saying? Just, okay, I'll deal with you. Just contaminating everything. But now Jesus got the nerve to not just stop, but to ask questions. Here we go. Look, come on. You see the crowd uh, crowding against you is what his disciples now answer. And yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus. <laughs> Kept looking around to see who had done it. And Jairus is just waiting. How long is this? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? 20 minutes? How long is Jesus looking around? And then what, what happens? Here we go, next verse. Then the woman. It's gotta be long enough for the woman to feel awkward. Because finally, she speaks up. Anybody ever been at a church where, like, to raise the offering, they have people stand up? No, no. And, like, has anybody ever been in an awkward? I've been in some awkward services where the pastor raises up the offering, and he will not stop until enough people stand up. No, nobody's ever, have you ever been in services like this? You know, where the preacher's like, I sense by the Spirit of the Lord there's a hundred people in the room. We're going to give up. And he'll, it's like eight people stood up. And he's like, I will wait for the rest of y'all, 92 people. <laughs> it gets awkward. It got awkward enough for the woman to finally what? With fear and trembling, tells him the whole truth. He now says to her, daughter. Now, this is a key word. Because... Which daughter is Jairus thinking about? His daughter. And Jesus stops and says, what? Your, your what? Your has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your. Here, here's what I love. Here's what I love. I need you to get this. I need you to get this. The woman had probably heard Jairus preach a lot of sermons. This was the first time Jairus got to hear the woman preach a sermon. Why would Jesus do this if it was not for what? Jairus' benefit. Because what is Jairus about to need? A whole lot of faith. A whole lot of faith. This is what I call a demonstrated sermon. Jesus is using everything around him to preach to Jairus. Jairus has all the, the status, but doesn't have the thoughts of this woman. Has the theological background, but the woman knows something about Jesus that Jairus does not know about Jesus. Here's what the woman knows. The woman knows this. The woman knows Jairus told me that whatever I touch becomes unclean. Jairus taught me that if I touch Jesus, I'll make Jesus unclean. But what I believe is that if Jesus touches me, he'll make me clean. See, this is the reversal of holiness. In the Old Testament, everyone was scared that if something unclean touched something holy, that you would contaminate it. But the reversal of the veil being torn is not just for people to get in, but for the holiness to get out. This is the reversal of the New Testament. And the woman understands more about the power of Jesus than Jairus understands about Jesus. No formal training and knows more than the synagogue leader. <laughs> Ain't never been to seminary and understands if I touch him, I will not make him dirty. If I touch him, I will not contaminate him. 
If I touch him, I will not remove any of his holiness. But if I touch him, everything on him will get on me. If I touch him, then the power on him will heal me. If I touch him, then the flow of blood that the doctors couldn't take away will begin to dry up in the blink of an eye. If I touch him, this is the flow of holiness in the New Testament. That the common does not desecrate the holy. But the holy overpowers the things of the world that are not consecrated. Which means you can go to your cousin's cookout. <laughs> because greater is he that is in you than he that's within the world. I bring his power everywhere I go. What's the point of soaking in his presence if it's got to stay in a room? What's the point of a spiritual emphasis week if I don't change the employees that I'm around every single day? What's the point of learning a Bible in church if it never changes my thought process? No, come on, let's keep reading. While Jesus is still speaking, Jesus is, this, this means, this means that Mark and Matthew don't even capture all of the words of Jesus. He said more than who touched me. So Jesus is talking. Daughter, your faith healed you and you're free from yourself. And clearly Jesus got more to say. And this, is the, this is the equivalent of Mark going dot, dot, dot. While Jesus is still talking, what happens? Some people came, that came, not aim, from the what? Of, we, this is how we know Jairus is probably wealthy. He got people in his house. In, in the first century, if your house is large enough to have a whole lot of people, it means a big house. Okay, no, okay, come on. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the who? The reason that they don't think Jesus can help is because for them, Jesus is only a, for the woman, Jesus is way more than a teacher. These people live with Jairus. This woman has been estranged from the synagogue probably for 12 years and knows more theology than the folks that live with Jairus. Come on, let's keep going. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the anymore? Overhearing, Jesus eavesdropping. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Just believe. Do you know that God will give you a booster shot of faith right before you are about to need to believe him for more than you've ever had to believe him before? See, what is an interruption for Jairus is a demonstration for Jesus. This woman and this whole conversation is a whole interval. Imagine what Jarvis is thinking at this point. If we had just got to my house. Jairus and Lazarus' sisters got a lot in common. If you had just been here. If you had just hurried up. If, if you had just been my genie. And not my God. If you had just followed me, <laughs> if you had just done what I wanted you to do, we wouldn't be in this scenario. And now who takes the lead? Come on. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of John. See, see, in the beginning of the story, Jesus is following Jairus. Now, Jesus is like, now let's do this the right way. 
you can follow me. How often do we want to lead Jesus to all of our problems and all of our difficulties thinking that the interruptions were not intentional on the part of Jesus? That woman stopping Jesus was a part of his divine plan to teach Jairus, number one, the definition of holiness. Number two, to teach Jairus what real faith looks like. And number three, to let Jairus know that his mindset has to change. Here we go. I've got a couple of minutes left. You learn anything tonight? I wrote this today. I can maybe preach this in Illinois. You're like, I don't know. He's like, I don't. he didn't affirm that at all. He was just like, I don't know. Here we go. Here we go. Remember, though, oh, did I tell you my title? I'm one thought away. I'm one thought away. Okay, let's do this. Can I teach? Can, I, can we do this? Come on. For years, I had this old black MacBook, old computer. Anybody remember when Apple made black MacBooks? Yeah, you remember. Okay, a couple of us. I just dated myself. Okay, um, old black MacBook. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And, and, and years went by, and the silver ones came out, like the new ones, you know, the shiny ones. And I just thought to myself, nah. Because before the black, when they had the white ones, don't nobody remember this? No? Okay, you remember the white, the white Mac, the plastic white ones? Come on, photo booth was the dopest thing about it. <laughs> and then there was the cool black one, and then there was the silver ones. And, you know, every time the computer said, do you want to update your software? I would always say, yeah, you know, update the software, update the software, update the software. There's always, you know, leopard, snow leopard, and cheetah. Whatever, you know what I'm saying? Mountain lion, all types of like OS operating systems. And then one day I went to update the the operating system and my classic vintage, I'm not gonna say old, beautiful, trendy, retro black MacBook would not accept the software update. So I did what anybody would do. I took it the Mac store, waited in a long line to talk to an Apple genius. Anybody ever feel like the Apple geniuses ain't geniuses? But anyway, anyway. <laughs> Might have been like, hmm, self-proclaimed genius, okay. Waiting, I finally talked to the Apple genius and the Apple genius said this to me. He said, well, you don't have a software issue. You actually have a hardware issue. Sir, I'm here to alert you of the fact that your device is so old <laughs> that you can no longer get our software updates. The only way to get the new software is to purchase new hardware. My frustration sometimes in church is that we diagnose people with software issues, but really they have a hardware issue. We try to give people with the mind of Adam new thoughts. But you can't get Jesus' thoughts with your old man's mind. You are still living in the mind of Adam, but you want the thoughts of Christ. I can tell you to get confident thoughts all day long, but if you still have an insecure mind, confident thoughts are never going to come out of an insecure mind. And so, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> we do thought training. Hey, think these thoughts. But the problem is that we keep trying to update the software when really you need to adopt the mind of Christ. What does adopting the mind of Christ mean? Oh, I'm here to tell you. There's five mindsets you need to adopt if you're going to adopt the mind of Christ. The woman actually has all five, and guess what? I'm only going to give you three. 
<laughs> you love it. You love it. <laughs> well, I love it. <laughs> Number one, five mindsets. The woman has all five. Jairus does not. What we are seeing is Jairus is attempting to have the right thoughts, but he does not have the right mind. Actually, let me give you a verse real quick. I think, uh, I think there's a verse from Philippians, and I've got it in the NIV and the King James. It says, let this mind, this is the King James, actually it's my favorite. Let this be what? Which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus is not just trying to get you to think new thoughts. He's trying to get you to adopt a new mind. The problem is not your thoughts. The problem is the mind that's creating your thoughts. You will always have toxic thoughts until you reject the mind of Adam. At some point, you are going to have to declare, the mind of Adam has taken me as far as it can take me. But the mind of Adam will always be insecure. The mind of Adam will always blame. The mind of Adam will always hide. The mind of Adam will always be stuck in shame. The mind of Adam will always be rational because the mind of Adam ate from the tree when it was not supposed to. The mind of Adam is broken. The mind of Adam will tell you to compare. The mind of Adam will tell you to be jealous. The mind of Adam will tell you to be envious. The mind of Adam will tell you that you're all crabs in a barrel. The mind of Adam will tell you that we're all playing musical chairs, that there's not enough, and you gotta compete with everybody else. The mind of Adam is the way the secular world works. And the problem is if we try to give you new thoughts but don't ever change your mind, then we always have to continue telling you what to think. But I don't want to tell you what to think. I want to help you learn how to think. In order to learn how to think, not just what to think, you need a new mind. Jayon is my spiritual son. I've known Jayon since he was 13 years old. Love this kid. The reason I trust Tim, the reason I trust what I put in him enough to send him to a college campus is because when he was in my youth group, I did not teach him what to think. I taught him how to think. I didn't put thoughts in him. I put a mind in him. If you put a mind in someone, you can drop them off at a Catholic school. They ain't going to become Catholic. You can expose them to anything. They're never going to get brainwashed. You know why? Because you taught them how to think, not what to think. We can't just teach people what to think. You know why? Because the world keeps inventing new sin. What happens when there's a version of a sin that's been invented and I ain't got time to tell him what to think yet? I've got to tell him how to think so that his mind works the right way. And if you have the right mind, the right mind will always produce the right thoughts. Let this what? Mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Come on, five mindsets. Everybody say five. Five mindsets that you need to adopt. Number one, a trust mindset. A trust mindset. Where do we get our mind? The mind you were born with is a mind of Adam. So we have to go to Genesis chapter three. How did your mind get corrupted? It got corrupted through the fall. And what does the enemy say to Eve? She casts doubt on the character and the nature of God. God's trying to keep something from you. God doesn't want you to have what God has. You know, the enemy will typically tempt you with something you already have. What does the Bible say? Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. And what does the serpent tempt Eve with? To become like God. All Eve had to say is, baby, I'm already like God. What does Satan tempt Jesus with? To turn what? Rocks into bread. Jesus is going to multiply bread later on. He always tempts you with stuff you already got. He's tempted you to have sexual relations with another woman, and you got a woman. Uh-oh, see, that went right up. You already got one of those at home that you married to. Uh-oh, y'all not ready. Okay, okay, come on. <laughs> a trust mindset. Come on, give us, give us Genesis. Give me Genesis. Now the serpent was more what? Than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say we must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it. God didn't say that, by the way. Or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God, for God, that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Already like God. Tempted with something that they already had. Let's keep going. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining what? Which is what God wanted to give her. She took some and she what? She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Which means the first sin of man is not to abuse woman but to stand there silent. To stand there and not talk while the serpent talked to his wife. Let's keep going. Then their eyes were both open. And this is the part that blows my mind. So they sewed fig leaves together and made what? Coverings for themselves. Can we skip all the way to verse 21? Oh, Genesis 3, verse 21. It should be there. I'll tell you exactly what happens in 321. God makes coverings for them. You know, what you believe about God will dictate everything else about your life. You think he's angry, you'll stay away. God was not there in the garden to catch them. He was there to cover them. Want to know what we find out later? That from the foundations of the earth, that the lamb had already been slain. God does not make coverings. Oh, and let me make this plain. The only way to get coverings is to kill an animal. The first sacrifice recorded in scripture was not a sacrifice that a human made to God, but a sacrifice that God made to cover broken humanity. Because what God is trying to communicate is this. Adam, your fig leaves are not going to do it. He first, the enemy first gives you a mindset that God cannot be trusted. He's holding out on me. Can't trust him. He doesn't have my best interest at heart. If I yield to the will of God, he's going to send me to Mozambique somewhere. Come on, don't act like. Why do we always assume God is going to do something that we're going to hate? The first mindset that you have to adopt is this. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. Not only is he good, he wants good for me. He loves me. He loves Jairus. He loves Jairus' daughter. He loves the woman. He wants good for everyone in the story. The first mindset that has to be changed is your ability to trust the creator. Because if you don't trust him, you will begin to trust you. And you will always get you into trouble. The reason you disobey God is because you trust yourself. The reason you disobey God is because you trust your flesh. The reason that you would withhold money from God is because you don't trust him. You trust your math. You trust your rationale. You trust your, come on, mind. The only problem is that your mind is the mind of Adam. The first step from the mind of to the mind of is to begin to trust. What does trust sound like? It sounds like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, he had to go to the garden because he has to undo what happened in the first garden. And what does he say in the garden? Not my will, but your will be done. You want to know what that means? I trust you more than I trust me. The mind of Christ says, I trust you 
more than I trust myself. I don't trust my gut. I don't trust my instinct. I don't trust my mind. You know why? I was born with the mind of Adam. I trust God. I trust what the Holy Spirit says. I trust the word of God. I trust all of it from Genesis to Revelation. I trust it. I trust the Lord. And if I don't trust him, I know the only other alternative is to trust me. What do Adam and Eve do? They get wisdom and they get God's crown. They were supposed to live in, dependent. They didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. So every time they encountered something, they had to ask, hey God, is this good or is this evil? And God went, oh yeah, that's good. Next day, hey God, is this good this is evil? Ah, that's evil. Ah, okay, good. Why she didn't ask about the serpent, I don't know. What do they want? They don't want to have to check with God every day. If we got the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves, we can judge for our self. The whole book of Judges is wrapped up in this one phrase, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes because Israel had no king. Their king was supposed to be Yahweh, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I ask you a question tonight? Who do you trust? Because you can never trust others if you don't first trust God. Because you don't know if the person is from God or not. You just trust you. You trusted yourself and yourself got you in relationships with people you shouldn't have been in. Maybe, just maybe, the person that's easiest to trust, which is yourself, is the person you should be the most leery of. And the person who deserves your trust the most is the person who you're the most leery of. So many of us, we're so quick to say yes to the enemy and no to God when God is the only one that we should really be saying yes to. Trust. Trust. This woman trusts. She trusts that she's not going to get stoned. She has to trust in the compassion and the love and the healing power of Jesus before anything else. Maybe you're in the room tonight. And you can be honest. You've tried to adopt new thoughts. And every single time you try to adopt new thoughts, it only lasts a couple of days because the real issue is not your thoughts. The real issue is your, if that's you, come on, wave at me. I want to know who I'm preaching to. Come on, I want to know who I'm preaching to. And here we go, second. Keep your hand lifted if that's you. Here we go, second. Here we go, second. You, if you were honest, you don't really trust the Lord. There's this small little part of you that wants to protect self. And you know that trusting God means dying to self. And the lie of the enemy is to preserve your own life. So you've said yes to God, but you have a guard up, even with God. God will tell you to do something, it'll take days for you to obey. Because you trust your feelings more than you trust his word. Come on, if that's you. Come on. Come on. Can I invite you into a prayer tonight? Now I got four more mindsets, so that means we got a lot to preach about tomorrow. Because the second is a faith mindset. You can't have faith in God if you don't trust him. Faith is impossible without first the trust that is exhibited in obedience. Third is an abundance mindset. For a lot of you, you live with a scarcity mindset. A scarcity mindset is the mind of Adam. Fourth, an identity mindset. You can't have secure thoughts when your mindset is insecure. Insecure is not a thought, it's actually a mindset. And then fifth, an interconnected mindset. Five mindsets. We'll talk about all four tomorrow. Come on. If you're in the, you're, oh, let me give you time to take notes. I see pens. I see pens moving. 
If tonight is your first time ever hearing the difference between thoughts and mindsets, go ahead, wave at me. There we go. That's a lot of, that's a lot of hands in the room. There's a lot of hands in the room. Tonight's your first time hearing the difference between a thought and a mindset. Here's my prayer. Is that you wouldn't just get, try to keep updating the software. Is that you would ditch the hardware and adopt the mind of Christ. Come on, if that's you, you, let's all stand, first off. Let's all stand. If you're saying tonight, Pastor Manny, I have tried so hard to have new thoughts. I got news for you. I'm not a self-help teacher. We teach in the gospel. You can go to a self-help seminar and they can tell you how to have positive thinking. I have no interest in that. Because <laughs> that's just someone in the mind of Adam trying to tell another person in the mind of Adam how to be a better mind of Adam. Self-help is a bunch of baloney. When you focus on self, you know what you're gonna see? A wicked and foul heart, because you are a sinner. Basing identity on how awesome you are is insanely futile. The thing that makes you amazing is that God created you and that you are made in his image. I'm broken. So if I try to base my identity on what I see, man, I'm gonna see a lot of flaws. If you're in the room tonight and you're saying, man, I need to change my mind. I need to change my mind. Come on, wave at me. I want to pray for you. Can you do something bold? Come on, can you meet me down here? Let's pray. Come on, let's gather at the altar. Nothing spooky or magical about the altar, but guess what? Just like the woman pressed through the crowd, it takes faith just to walk down to the front. It takes faith. Something spiritual about the journey from your seat down to the altar that helps your brain believe. Nah, when I get back to my seat, something's going to be different. I'm changing. Come on. Hands lifted. God, I thank you. This is not a positive self-help seminar. Nah. We declare that we're one thought away. You want to know what that thought is? That Jesus, I need to adopt your mind. I need to adopt your mind. So, man, I complicate things and I overthink things and I worry about stuff and I stress about stuff that you've already handled, God, and you keep telling me to change my thinking and tonight I give up. I surrender. I surrender. God, whatever you say, I'm just going to believe you. I'm going to decide to trust you. I want to trust you. I trust what you have to say about marriage. I trust what you have to say about parenting. I trust what you have to say in your word about fight. I just trust you. I trust you. I open myself up to trusting you. We rebuke doubt and fear in the name of Jesus. And we declare right now that the mind of Adam is cast down. We declare that whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So God, we bind up the mind of Adam that is active within us and we dethrone ourself and we in humility declare you, oh God, know what's best. You know a plan. You have a plan for us. You have a purpose. God, we relent. We give up we surrender. God, I'm done trying to be the Lord of my own life and calling you Lord. God, that is not going to work. You are in control. I give up. I've tried it my own way. And I keep getting to this dead end. So God, I give up. I trust you. Come on, I trust you. Wherever you are, come on, can you just say that to the Lord? I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust that you're going to handle it. I trust that you're going to fix it. I trust that if you don't fix it, it's because it's there to make me better. I trust you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship in the room. I was doing some research just for the sermon and uh, just doing some study on like, what was this woman sick with? And uh, it would have been a, a hemorrhaging bleeding issue, the menstrual hemorrhaging bleeding problem. And today with modern medicine, that 
may not be something that could take someone's life. But actually in the first century, this specific illness was a, was a death wish. Which means that doctors would have told this woman, get your affairs in order. You may have a year or two. You want to know what's crazy? She made it into year three with a sickness that should have killed her in the first two. And then I bet the doctors gave her another prognosis. You're going to die after another couple of years. And then guess what? She made it into year five. And then she shocked doctors again because she made it a decade with an issue that should have killed her in the first couple of years. And then she made it 12 years with a problem that should have killed her in the first couple of years of the issue. And sometimes we are so spoiled that we're angry that God didn't heal us, but we forgot that you shouldn't even be alive. And I wonder if there's anybody who trusts him enough to say, you may not have done what I wanted you to do, but I survived. I'm still here and that's enough for me you may not have done everything i wanted you to do but if i stay alive long enough i'll get healed eventually is there anybody in the room who can declare i will not withhold praise just because he did not heal me i will acknowledge i shouldn't even be alive shouldn't even be alive we know this woman We've all called her this, the suffering woman. She suffered. Can I shift your mindset? She wasn't the suffering woman. She was the surviving woman. Can I shift your mindset? Come on. You're not a sufferer. You're a survivor. If you're in this room, you're a survivor. Come on. You're a survivor. You're a survivor. You're a survivor. You're a survivor. Not saying there wasn't suffering in it, but the fact that there's breath in your lungs is proof that you survived. You survived the attack, you survived the issue, you survived the disease, and the temptation is to withhold praise. Because some of us have a little attitude. Can't believe he didn't heal me yet. Spent all my money, been isolated, can't go to the synagogue, he doesn't deserve my praise. But the woman comes to him, not with arrogance, but on her knees with a posture that says, I don't deserve anything from you. And you know when we're grateful for what we got? Something about God that wants to give us more. And when we don't appreciate what we have, nothing is ever enough. Can we shift our mindset tonight? In gratitude, can we just lift up our hands? God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to complain about the money I don't have. I'm going to praise you for the money that's in my bank account right now. I am not going to complain about the healing I don't have. I'm just going to thank you for the fact that I have the ability to lift up my hands. I got everything I need. God, you're more than enough. God, thank you. God, thank you. God, thank you. Can gratitude just overflow in the room? Can we just have some gratitude to overflow?